Peter Marshall, uh, thank you very, very much for um, coming along and agreeing to do this interview. How are you? Uh, very well, David. Really pleased to be here. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. We're here to talk about um, Heretics and Believers, uh, a history of the English Reformation, uh, which I have a copy of here, which I've turned over lots and lots of pages where I came along, uh, came across new and interesting things. So what, uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, what made you want to write the book, first of all? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, and um, uh, maybe the honest answer is a kind of midlife crisis, <laughs> really. <laughs> um, uh, so I think there are two. There are really two aspects to that. I mean, one is um, it, it is a broader one about the field, mm. um, and uh, the idea that perhaps it was time for a, a new sort of synoptic um, history of the English Reformation, mm. possibly reaching out to a slightly wider audience uh, than just you know students and fellow scholars in in the academy, mm. and arguably the last time that was done was. Um, Christopher Hague's English Reformations in the early 1990s and the time before that is, is probably A.G. Dickens' um, English Reformation in 1964. So I sort of somehow felt there was a kind of moment to, um, uh, to, 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 to intervene there again. Mm. I guess the more personal answer is just I've been you know, doing English Reformation things for an, a, an awful long time and I thought it was really time to put my money where my, my mouth was and right. to try and um, <laughs> see if I had things, interesting things to say about the, the topic um, and indeed to decide whether I was then done with it or would <laughs> uh, carry on. <laughs> and do you feel done with it? Then? I think it's a bit early to, to tell really. Yeah. Um, there are sort of slightly different things I want to do in, in the immediate term but um, you know, as, I, as I'm sure you know it's, uh, it's rather difficult to shake a topic off and you always become right. known as the expert in the thing you were researching last year or the year yeah. before. Yeah, as well as being something that's intended for a kind of big general audience, um, it's got big kind of meaty arguments in there as well. Can you just tell us, sketch those out for us? Uh, good, well I'm, I'm, I'm glad you think that, that, that it does. I mean my worry at some points was that um, the, the arguments become rather submerged in the detail and the, the narrative and just to sort of take a a slightly longer run up to, to your question. Um, uh, I really decided from the start I wanted to write a narrative uh, account. Um, uh, and we might come back to you know, um, th th that concept and how that, that works. Which, um, so it was not going to have sort of thematic chapters, um, which are the places where perhaps it's rather easier uh, to, um, to, to spell out arguments uh, of, that, of that kind. Um, and I also decided, um, at quite an early stage that um, I wasn't going to explicitly engage with existing historiography of the topic. Um, I, in, in fact, the rule I set myself right at the start was that I wasn't going to put the names of any modern historians anywhere in my main text. Well, I think your, um, many of your readers will be very happy. About well, that. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, it, uh, um, it was partly, of course, an attempt um, to uh, uh, you know, recognize what perhaps we in the business slightly lose sight of, mm. which is that general readers are more interested in the topic than in our kind of particular turf wars yeah. uh, around the topic. So it, it was positioning the book in, in that sense. Stephen Pinker, who is sort of a big popular science mm -hmm. writer, and he's yeah. also he's written a lot about how to communicate with a, a popular audience. You know, he's pointed out that a lot of people seem to start their books and their articles and so on with sentences like, um, you know, in recent decades, scholars have argued, blah, blah, blah. And I find myself using that all the time in a really yeah, yeah. tired sort of way. Um, you know, he pointed out that um, you know, most readers really don't care what scholars have been doing for the last <laughs> 10 years. Um, so w was that sort of in it, your mind? It, 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 was, it was, I think. Um, and also just to sort of give myself some space mm. to sit back from, from the topic and, um, you know, rather than everything being kind of positioned oppositionally, from revisionism to post-revisionism to post-post-revisionism, mm. um, to j just take a little bit of, of time to see how the subject kind of felt to me and how it would emerge as I tried to produce a narrative account of it. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I'm actually tremendously grateful for uh, was advice from my editor at, uh, at Yale and indeed from uh, um, uh, several friends who read the, the typescript. Because um, I thought... Uh, I thought the sort of major arguments would would kind of emerge. They would uh, they would appear at various points in, in the book, and then I would recap them all at the end. Mm. 
Um, and the, the sort of almost universal response from these readers was, simply when I got to the end, I realized that's exactly what you're saying. Um, and so my, uh, my Yale editor said, turn your conclusion into your introduction. Yeah. So that's almost literally exactly what I, what I did yeah. uh, with a little bit of sort of rejigging. So um, th th there is a kind of uh, a preface or introduction, I forget now exactly what I called it, <laughs> where I, I try and spell out what it seemed to me are the, the main kind of arguments uh, of, of the book. Um, <clears throat> I think that's, because uh, I often find myself giving that advice to students yeah. and then sort of not following it myself, <laughs> um, which is probably, I mean, yeah. there are probably lots of things like that where you, because um, I, I know you've given an, another interview where you, you sort of said that uh, you had a word count for this book and uh, at Warwick they have very strict word counts, you know, you, you, have, you get dot yeah. marks if you go over it and That's so right. on, and you went sort of oh, 100,000 words I, or something. I went like 140,000 right. words so yeah. over the word count, which is sort of utterly ridiculous, and uh, I still can't quite believe that the, the press allowed me to, to, yeah. to get away with it. Right. <laughs> but, but in the end, they were, they were happy to, to take it, and um, I, 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 mean, I sort of feel the treatment I wanted to give it in the end needed, I mean this sounds rather sort of arrogant thing to say, but I think it, it, it kind of needed that, that length um, if it wasn't just going to be a sort of another brisk survey. Yeah. Heretics and believers is deliberately sort of ambiguous and ironic, you know, who are the heretics, who are the true believers, and mm. you know, that's kind of one of the arguments of the book, is um, uh, the way that English society divides um, in oppositional ways over religion. Um, but I also wanted that plural heretics and believers in the title to, to flag up that the book is really about the agency of people, mm. and as far as possible about the agency of, of, of ordinary people. Um, so, I mean, of course, in one sense, there are large impersonal forces mm. <laughs> um, which, which shape things, um, economic, cultural, um, all the rest of it. Um, but that really wasn't the book I wanted to write. I wanted to, to write about um, contingency, mm. we used to call events, <laughs> um, <laughs> and about the role of, of people at all levels of society in actually shaping those. So I suppose that's the principal argument mm. of the book, which is that for good or ill, um, the English people um, make their own reformation. Mm. So it's a bottom-up <clears throat> rather than a top-down, or well, a mixture of the two. Yes, um, and of course that's, that, that's one of the, the very um, people who've studied the English Reformation, they may recognise there's a wonderful essay by Christopher Haig, mentioned just a little while ago, uh, from the early 1980s on the recent historiography, as it was yeah. then, of the English Reformation, um, where he has this wonderful set of double axes mm -hmm. about whether the Reformation is uh, from top-down or bottom-up, and whether it's fast or slow. Mm -hmm and almost everybody's work can be plotted somewhere yeah. on those two axes if they're fast from below or, or slow from on top. And it's, you know, it's wonderfully useful, um, but, but in a way kind of too neat, I think. Mm. Um, and uh, the bottom up versus top down um, seems to me kind of a false dichotomy. Mm. I mean, the, the fact that the, the English state, if we want to call it that, mm. the crown, uh, political authority, is a, a major factor in the making of these changes is, of course, you know, absolutely um, uh, un undeniable mm. and <laughs> common knowledge. Yeah. Uh, in, in one sense, a lot of this does start with Henry VIII's marital difficulties in the, uh, in the late 1520s. Um, so uh, I absolutely don't want to kind of you know, minimize uh, the, the role of political authority in, in making this. Um, but uh, it doesn't do it on its own. Um, and it doesn't get what it wants, which mm. I think is, is the key thing. Um, and well, I, th I think that's, I mean, one of the, the things that really <coughs> resonated with me is um, where you're sort of discussing how the Reformation inadvertently undermines political authority. You know, that there's a sense in which um, kings are elevated by being made, you know, head, supreme head of the church and all, all yep. that sort of stuff. Um, but also um, other people now think they're heretics. What was also really is interesting is you were talking about a lot in the book about um, public opinion and mm. how the Reformation kind of creates it and kind of conjures it into being. But, yeah. you know, both in the sense that reformers and leaders of the Reformation try to kind of appeal to, to public opinion, yeah. but also that it's kind of weaponized by rulers um, as a tool in, in international diplomacy. In 1528, the Berlin's sort of, this, this seems to be a proposal that comes from the Berlins anyway, they, um, they try to 
to put together a petition of leading noblemen to sort of present the divorce as having kind of the consent of yeah. the, at least the elite political nation. Yeah, um, yeah. But and, what, and to mean, bully the Pope. Basically. Right, exactly, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, um, but that to me seems to imply that, you know, that public opinion, in s s however you wish to conceive it, mm -hmm. and you could say, well, public opinion is just the nobility or, you know, the, the political yeah. nation or that it's, it's broader, um, is more important in political culture perhaps than, than we, we tend to think. Well, I, th I think that's right. And it, I'm, I'm very conscious this is kind of more your field than, than mine, David. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm not going to go and, on and on about <laughs> it. <laughs> and of course, I, I, I worried a bit about the, the, the term of art here, public opinion. And I, you know, I was it, this is the sort of thing that historians pass endlessly. And yeah. um, you know, the discussions about the public sphere in the early modern period and who participates in the public sphere and, and so on. So I suppose my, my use of terms like um, public opinion is a, a, a rather sort of um, uh, inexact yeah. kind of common sense way of, of approaching it. But mm. um, yes, I think um, you'd summarise that very nicely. I mean, what I wanted to, to, to say is that um, uh, authority uh, at every stage of the Reformation process, starting with Henry VIII's divorce, um, not only needs to impose its will, it needs to be seen to be right. Mm. It needs to persuade people uh, and to persuade actually not only the elite, um, but a much larger um, section of, of, of the population. So there are works in the vernacular for a wider audience. There's the use of the pulpit, obviously. There's <clears throat> you know, even things like um, uh, copies of the Act of, of Appeal, that great declaration of, of independence um, from 1533 uh, being posted on every church door. Um, <clears throat> again, to use an anachronistic term, but uh, what we can't sort of get away from, there's an awful lot of, of propaganda. Mm. Um, but the thing that uh, I think I'd always known but became clearer to me in the course of, of writing the book is that propaganda is always double-edged. Yeah. It always kind of, you know, any attempt to persuade advertises the alternative possibilities. Well, that, I think know. that was, yeah, I mean, sort of a wonderful thing that comes up again and again is of people like Thomas More trying to kind of refute reformers, but then basically including almost complete copies of their tracks in yes. his refutation. Yes, no, it, it yeah. happens literally in that way throughout mm -hmm. the 16th century, that, that that style of polemical refutation always involved the quotation of very large chunks of your opponent's yeah. work. So, yeah. you know, this is the best way to sort of read Tyndale in the 1530s is to acquire copies of Moore. Yeah. Uh, and indeed, probably the best way to read the works of exiled Catholic yeah. polemicists he, later in the 16th century. He seems particularly bad at that, actually. I, I, I don't know. I, that's the impression, because I've come across um, the supplication of souls, yes. which is a response to... Um, the supplication of the beggars, That's right. which is this sort of tract in that Simon Fish writes mm -hmm. um, in 1529, which sort of says, you know, "We the beggars, we're being impoverished by the terrible corruption of the um, of the clergy." Mm -hmm. uh, and then Moore's response sort of um, embodies another voice, which is the the voice of souls who are in purgatory. Yeah. Um, but he he basically repeats all of the juiciest arguments. Of, of fish and, and, and pretty much kind yeah. of repeats the whole tract. Um, yeah. That's a bit silly, isn't it? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> well, I think Moore faces precisely this this dilemma. You know, he, it's not that he's unaware mm. of the fact that he is advertising the views of these heretics. He mm. he, he simply thinks he cannot remain silent in, mm. the, in the face of this threat. And I mean, I suppose it's it's the dilemma that sort of politically motivated people in, in all sorts of circumstances might, yeah. might feel. And um, you know, we're in very divisive political times now in the UK, we're in, as, as, as we speak, we're in the last stages of a very divisive um, election in, in the US. And you know, it's pretty clear that, um, that the processes of sort of stirring up one's own supporters also energize and radicalize the other side yeah. as, as well. And I think you know, that process can certainly be seen operating all the way through. Mm. Um, yeah. the, the 16th century. And the, the so sort of boundaries between uh, what later become Protestant and Catholic um, views are, th there's a process of polarisation um, that, that happens. I think that's, yes, that, 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 that's broadly right. I mean, um, one shouldn't, of course, be too um, sort of, you know, naively um, optimistic or, or, or rose-tinted about uh, the unity of medieval Catholicism. Mm -hmm. you know, I think um, in all sorts of ways, early 16th century England is, is quite um, uh, fragmented and, and polarised even within mm. um, the, the broad umbrella of, of, of Catholic faith. 
Um, and, and then, of course, there's a period of <laughs> quite extended confusion uh, set in motion um, by the, uh, the, the almost kind of accidental coincidence of, of Henry VIII's marital and political manoeuvres um, and the English branch of the reform movement, which starts in Germany with Martin Luther. Um, and uh, so one of the things that I want to, to emphasize in the book is that I think that those two, um, uh, you know, it would appear completely unconnected processes become very closely connected from a very early stage. So, I mean, I don't think the English Reformation can very helpfully be described as an act of state, but I don't even think Henry VIII's break with Rome can very usefully be described as just simply an, an act of state. Mm. Um, and uh, yes, I suppose those, um, th those modern or quasi-modern um, religious political identities of uh, Catholic and Protestant or uh, Protestant and Roman Catholic uh, do come into being uh, over the course of the, the 16th century, but mm. um, you know, slowly and rather painfully. It does seem like in the Reformation, um, in Reformation studies, that's more of a problem than it is in sort of some other areas. You know, that you, you can't use Protestant in the 1530s and, and yeah. that kind of thing. <clears throat> when can you start using that term? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, um, well, of course, one, one, one can end up being... Um, uh, rather silly about this, yeah. um, and um, you know, the, we, we can only use terms exactly as they were used by our contemporary subjects. And then, of course, even that doesn't solve the problem because they use them in very sort of slanted and, and political ways. So, um, I, I suppose uh, my feeling on this is that you can use the terminology you want, so long as you're kind of aware of the issues ar around it. Mm. Um, I mean, Protestant, I think, is an example, and I've written elsewhere about about this. We all kind of know what we mean when we talk about you know, the Protestants in the 16th century. Yeah. Um, uh, so it appears to me that the word is not being regularly used by English people about themselves until some way into Elizabeth's reign. Mm. I, I do talk about this a bit in, in, in the book, and I think the answer is I think that the, the, the terms, the names, are actually part of the story. Mm. You know, what names people call each other. Mm. One of the things that's very striking about the 16th century is that all of those familiar names, um, Protestant, uh, Lutheran, Puritan, uh, they all start as terms of abuse. Mm. Um, the only one that doesn't really is Catholic. Yeah. Uh, and Catholic, of course, is the identity which everybody wants to have. Everybody is claiming to be uh, the true Catholics, mm. the true Catholic Church. Um, universal church mentioned in the creeds and, and so on. So uh, people we might naturally think of as, as the Catholics, i.e. religious conservatives who sort of quite like the Pope, um, have their own special nickname invented for them in the course of this, which is Papist. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are these terms flying around, um, and uh, I, th I don't think it's, it, it's very sensible to be sort of absolutist about this and say you, you, know, you can't use this term at this period. And so, you know, when people routinely started to call themselves Protestants, not entirely clear. I think it might be rather later, actually, mm. than, than we used to think, but I don't have a particular problem um, w w with using that term for the mid-16th century. Mm. Um, uh, I think sometimes, though, um, an awareness that there are difficulties with the terms is just a reminder that people weren't putting themselves in, in boxes. And, of yeah. course, you know, we tend, um, naturally enough, we, we read history backwards because you know, we're at the, the end of the process that it's led to. And religious history in particular, I think, um, is uh, sometimes rather unhelpfully obsessed with, with origins, you know, the origins of traditions, our fathers in the faith, whichever particular mm -hmm. faith um, it, it is. Um, and, of course, that's produced very important work, but I think it can sometimes lose sight of the fact that, I mean, just to, to give a very obvious example, that um, you know, Martin Luther didn't think he was a Protestant, never called himself that. Um, he was a late medieval Catholic reformer, um, as was uh, William Tyndale or any number of other people in, in, in England. So um, I think just a bit of care with the terminology reminds us that the story is not yet completely scripted and that these identities and the names that go with these identities really take some time to emerge. I mean, one of the other, the other sort of themes, I guess, or the big arguments uh, was sort of about how violent and coercive the Reformation was. Um, there were a couple of really striking things, uh, examples that you, you used in the book. Um, it's the fact that the, in the Pilgrimage of Grace um, which is the sort of big rebellion in the Henrician period uh, against uh, the dissolution of the monasteries and, and reform. Um, 
50,000 people uh, were, were involved, uh, I, I think, in that rebellion, which yeah. you point out is bigger than any army that was ever fielded by, sure. by Tudor monarchs in the whole 16th yeah. century. Yeah. Um, and the other really lovely example, I think, is the, um, in the 1549 hmm. Prayer Book Rebellion, which is another sort of conservative, mm -hmm. maybe we can't use that word, it's in favour of traditional sure. religion rebellion. Um, yeah. 10,000 people, something like 10,000 people are, are killed, which yeah, is... Yeah, we're, we're not entirely sure. It might be ten or 11,000 across the country in the summer of 1549, including yeah. um, the, the rebellion in the southwest and mm. Devon and Cornwall, but, but also Ketch Rebellion yeah. in, in East Anglia. But, um, but I think you, you sort of, if you scale that up to the modern yeah. day, it's something like 200,000 people dying, I think yeah. you, you point yeah. out. Um, <clears throat> no, that, 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 that's right. Um, and um, partly I think this is... Um, <laughs> A sort of twofold reaction, really. Um, one is, um, and, and, and this is rather sort of um, de defensive and personal, but the idea that um, those of us who work on the English Reformation get from our continental colleagues that their Reformations were much more exciting. Yeah. They, had, <laughs> they had proper wars of religion, yeah. um, and we had a rather sort of boring bureaucratic yeah. Reformation in which the government sent orders to the church wardens and they carried yeah. them out. Um, <laughs> but uh, were, there and, <laughs> were there British historians in the past who sort of wanted it that way? Well, I think that, who... yes, I think that I think there were because, of course, uh, another of the sort of inherited cliches about the, the English Reformation is that it's tremendously English, mm. which means that um, it's, uh, it's fairly moderate and, yeah. and sensible. And of course, this is, um, uh, I think it's more or less okay to say this, this is a founding myth of the Church of England, for mm. example, that, that it is this via media, this middle way between uh, extremes of sort of zealous iconoclastic Protestantism on the one hand and um, a fervent Roman Catholicism on, on the other hand. And this fits in with myths about national character of mm. you know the pragmatism and good sense of the British and if I'm allowed to be a little bit political since the spring of 2016 <laughs> the pragmatism <laughs> and good sense of the British <laughs> seems rather more in question perhaps yeah. than it was in in some recent years so um, uh, and, and in that sort of rather mythic version of the English Reformation of course episodes uh, like um, the uh, prosecution of heretics in Mary's reign uh, or the iconoclastic destruction in Edward's reign seemed like aberrations. Um, in a lot of 19th and early 20th century presentations, you know, these were the kind of you know, moments where, bizarrely, the English Reformation was going a bit continental before mm. it sort of came back to its senses. Mm. Um, so, of course, um, one could go too far with this. There were not full-scale wars of religion in 16th century England. You could argue that 17th century England had full-scale wars of religion. That's yeah. a, a question I sort of... Um, uh, uh, avoid by stopping chronologically some way short uh, of the, uh, the, the, the wars of the 1640s and, and 50s. Um, but there are a lot of people killed. There is a, a, a lot of coercion. Mm -hmm. um, I think I worked out at one point that there are, um, there are pitched battles in every decade between mm -hmm. the 1530s and the early 1570s. Um, there are uh, in intensive periods of um, uh, of persecution of, of dissidents uh, under Henry VIII, under Mary famously, but you know also under uh, under Elizabeth, um, uh, and even in, in Edward's reign, where um, large numbers of people are not being executed for heresy, Anabaptists are being persecuted, um, and um, rebellious peasants, as you were just saying, are, are, are slain in really quite remarkable numbers. So um, it, it doesn't seem to really. Um uh, encroach that much on the popular imagination for some reason, the, the 1549 rebellions. Well, I don't know if you found that. I mean, a lot of people have heard of the Pilgrimage of Grace. Uh, a lot of people have heard yes. of the Marian um, persecutions. Yeah. But um, things like the 1549 rebellions, for some reason, I, I don't know what it is about Edward VI, but I don't know whether it's because it's a sort of short reign or. Mm. I don't know, people don't seem to really know. No, that's, about I, it. I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, and um, I'm not into, entirely sure why it is. I mean, uh, uh, we are, of course, obsessed with the Tudors. Yeah. Um, but I think we are obsessed literally with the Tudors, you know, yeah. i.e., with the, the members of that family who, in fact, going back to terminology, didn't call themselves Tudors. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a, a lot of sort of broader cultural interest, I think, in the um, in, in the 16th century, is with. I mean, understandably, it's with it's with the great and, and the good. And yeah. 1549 is about ordinary people. Mm. Um, and. Um, Yes, I mean, perhaps those historians uh, who uh, often, of course, coming politically from the left, who, who are very concerned 
um, with the memory of ordinary people and their political struggles and agency and so on. They've been more naturally drawn to the 1640s mm. um, and levellers and diggers and people like that and um, conservative peasants in Devon and Cornwall haven't appealed to them too much either. Yeah. So. Um, uh, yes, I think we should think more about 1549 um, and about 1569, which is, um, I think, a rather more serious um, rebellion than it's often been credit for. This mm. is the, the rising of the Northern Earls mm. in um, County Durham and, and, and Westmoreland, which is a, a major popular movement. Um, so sometimes, I, I suppose, the, the kind of people take the clue from the title, from what we call these things. You know, it's yes. Rising of the Northern Earls is seen as a sort of an elite aristocratic rebellion. Absolutely. And I think uh, there yeah. are there also, you know, there are historians who've sort of argued that many of the tenants in that rebellion were sort of coerced into it by the nobility. And so it didn't have the sort of popular heft behind it. That yes, a, a lot of scholars have, have said that. Um, so I think some of the best recent work, and of, mm. of course it you know, goes without saying that um, throughout the book I'm drawing on other people's research mm. um, much more th than I am um, my own at various points. Um, but I think some of the, the best recent research on uh, that rebellion shows that in fact um, most of the participants were, were not direct tenants of the Earls of Northumberland and, mm. and Westmoreland, um, that it's very widespread. Mm. Um, and that there is deep popular unease uh, across the north of England with the direction of the government's religious mm. policy. And, um, I suppose it's very difficult to judge the level of popular support for something based purely on who's willing to rebel um, yeah. in, in favour of it. Yeah, so it, it has been calculated that there are something like 80 parishes in, um, in, in the north of England uh, where there are acts of Catholic iconoclasm mm. in 1569, i.e., um, the collecting and burning of Bibles and prayer books, um, yeah. you know, which is not something that I think people would be doing, <laughs> would be doing lightly. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could get the impression from reading the book that you quite sympathise with uh, people who just sort of kept their heads down um, among all of these changes. I think someone who lives through this period um, could be forgiven for being completely confused about uh, what they're supposed to believe, mm. um, and yeah. how they're supposed to worship, and so on. You know, you, you've got a Reformation, Henrich and Reformation, and then it kind of goes back in a conservative yeah. direction in the 1540s, mm -hmm. and it goes back to the other, you know, swings to sure. the other extreme under Edward, yeah. goes back under Mary, yeah. and sort of somewhere in the middle under under Elizabeth. I, I got the impression yeah. that you, um, you know, you sympathised with people who didn't necessarily respond to that as most people didn't, by opting for kind of martyrdom or, or exile. Um, yeah. Is, is, that, is that what you would have done, do you think? If um, you had... Oh, a, a, absolutely. I mean, yeah. if you, you know, threatened me with, with, with torture yeah. and execution... <laughs> I won't. I'd yeah. be, well, that's, 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 that's a relief. I, I, you know, I'd be asking, yeah. where do I sign? Yeah. Um, you know, so I think most of us, most of us would. Mm. Um, so I think, yes, you know, naturally, I suppose, we, we empathise with those people. Mm. Um, and of course, they're, um, um, as you say, they're the majority, but ironically, they're the people who are most difficult to find in, in the record, because mm. dissidents of various kinds uh, generates records. Yeah. Um, you know, people who, who obey the rules, the conformists, um, uh, generally, generally don't. Um, going back to what you asked me right at the start about the sort of the, the major arguments in, in the book, one that I hope comes through, um, and I sort of hope is, is right, though it's a, in some ways a kind of intuitive feeling, is that um, I suspect historians might have overdone this line, mm. that the Reformation just absolutely confuses everybody. Oh, really? Mm. Um, uh, I mean, of course, the, the, there are these dramatic changes, and um, you know, if you were born in... Um, let's say 1520 and, uh, and, and live to 1600 or 1580, 1590, you know, you've seen uh, the whole sequence of them. Mm. Um, but all of these changes are accompanied by, pick up another of our themes from, from just now, various forms of persuasion and, and mm. propaganda. Yeah, and um, I, I suppose, so, I mean, confusion implies that it's just something that's kind of washing over you yeah. and that you're not responding to no, ab actively. Ab 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 absolutely. Yeah. So I think um, even though the, the great majority of people do not take um, sort of direct political action mm. in support or against the changes that they see happening to them. Uh, they're hearing a lot about these changes. Mm. I think they probably, if it was difficult to be certain about this, um, become uh, more aware of uh, the, the meanings of items in their parish church um, and of um, sort of key points of, of doctrine. Um, and I think probably more of them 
you know, genuinely agonize than we sometimes give them, them credit for. You know, we use words like conformity sometimes in a rather dismissive way. You know, mm. Mere conformity, or it was, uh, it was indifference. Um, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not sure we can be sure that that was the, the case. So I think the sort of, uh, the agonies of conscience that people went through, particularly those who, to use another um, term of abuse from the period, uh, are termed Nicodemites. Um, this is a term uh, which actually has biblical roots, since in John's Gospel, the Pharisee Nicodemus is drawn to the teachings of Jesus, um, but uh, will only come to him secretly at night um, because he's uh, frightened of, of, of persecution. So Calvin picks up this phrase uh, and uses it very disparagingly um, to indicate those who know the truth in their hearts, but because of um, fear of punishment, uh, outwardly conform to the wishes of the state and uh, what the English Reformation creates at every stage are very significant numbers of these Nicodemites and I, and I think their position could be interestingly sophisticated and was not simply one of um, uh, what is sometimes called the, the Vicar of Bray syndrome. This is a, a 17th century proverb um, about uh, the Vicar of Bray in Berkshire who is accused of having betrayed his principles and changed his position several times over the course of the 16th century. And he says, no, 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 I've always been true to my core principles and beliefs, um, which is that I wish to live and die the Vicar of Bray. <laughs> um, so th th that kind of cynical, pragmatic conformism I'm sure existed um, but there were, there were others, I think, um, who uh, found these processes of change extremely disquieting and difficult. Are there any um, popular misconceptions that, that you think people have about the, the Reformation? Because I sometimes find, um, when you talk to people about it, that, um, for instance, you know, the idea that some people might not have wanted the Bible in English is, comes as a bit of a, a surprise to, to people. Um, you know, I think people do tend to yeah. see the Reformation as this kind of liberation. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, and, and maybe it's something to do with the sort of more secular times that we're living in, but I find, um, you know, students are also often quite apt to assume that um, religion is almost exclusively a system of social control, and that's what it does, you know, during mm -hmm. this period. Yes. And, and, and also that... Um, you know, sort of picking up on what, what you said about um, people responding to the Reformation um, differently and, and actively and struggling with it. Um, the idea that uh, common people just sort of took what they were told by the church for granted and that was their only source of information and all, all that kind of thing. I mean, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think all of those are, are, are misconceptions. Um, and in, in a way, misconceptions are, are, are good because it shows that people are interested absolutely, in this period yeah. and uh, that, that it has a place in, in, in cultural memory. Um, I mean, I suppose, um, yes. Um, I mean, broadly, I suppose, um, although Britain is now a very secular uh, place, um, uh, it was at one point a very Protestant country and it's now a kind of uh, post-Protestant country. Mm. Um, so the, the idea that, um, broadly speaking, the Reformation was evidently a good thing mm. um, and, and a force of liberation, um, I think, is pretty deeply grounded, and I think that is, you know, that, that is worth challenging. And again, that's something I sort of <clears throat> flag up in, in the title, you know, heretics and believers. The sort of the, the, the different sides, I, I think, need to be treated with with equal respect, mm. and I think that their ideas and preoccupations are are, are equally are equally interesting. Um, uh, which is not to say that, you know, I want to um, re replace that narrative with another sort of mythic narrative about, you know, how um, uh, you know, everybody was a happy Catholic and, and the Reformation <laughs> was a sort of evil plot yeah. foisted on the country by a, um, a handful of um, uh, uh, politicians and, and, uh, and their cohorts. Mm. I mean, these are, of course, um, these modern myths have their roots mm. in different versions of the Reformation story which are generated... In, in the period themselves. Is, is that a sort of a challenge, do you think, of writing a, a popular history of the Reformation, that um, um, for all their, uh, for everything that's wrong with those kind of grand narratives of one kind or, or another, they do, they are at least kind of easily graspable and they sort of, you know, they, they kind of help people who are maybe not familiar with the periods have a sense of sort of why it's meaningful and, and why it's important mm -hmm. to them. Because yeah. it, it often seems to me that, um, you know, root, his, academic historians since the kind of 1970s have been quite good at knocking down um, grand narratives yes. and complicated and saying, you know, it, no, it's yeah. not complicated, which is always 
you know, what we should be doing as historians sure. is saying it's more complicated. Um, but the, the more that you do that, the more you, you sort of make it kind of confusing and, and difficult for, for a broader audience to understand. I think that's absolutely right, and I think it's a real problem. And um, yes, I mean, my, my, my instinct, um, my, my students I'm sure will, will confirm this, is to make things more, more complicated. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that's a really important role mm. that historians have, is to say, hang on, things may be more complicated than, than you think, and simplistic mm. historical myths. Yeah. Um, you, you, I you think know. you never lose marks when you're writing an essay for saying it was complicated. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and they can be dangerous, of, of, of course, you know, whether mm. in Bosnia or Ireland or you know, the United States or wherever it might be. So mm. I think, you know... Um, Academic historians, historical researchers, do have this obligation to say, well, yes, the path is difficult and confusing, but at the same time, we have an obligation to kind of map a way through it. Mm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think you know, it's often important to say um, that these, uh, these, these grand narratives, grand explanatory frameworks, often rather sort of progressivist ones, mm. um, people talk about Whig history in the 19th century tradition, and, and going over into the 20th, uh, you know, these needed to be to be challenged. But I think just knocking them down is not terribly um, interesting. I mean, finding replacement narratives is, of course, um, difficult. So, mm. in a sense, I think in my book, I do sort of come full circle back to those notions of um, liberation and modernity, but not perhaps by the root. Um, that historians of previous generations would have taken us there. I mean, the Reformation, it seems to me, more than anything else, is a case study in the law of unintended consequences. Right, absolutely. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's liberating in the sense that it gives people opportunities to take control of their own lives and of their own processes of thought and identity in ways that perhaps hadn't been possible before, mm. um, but not, uh, in my view at least, because it replaces an effective form of Christianity with a better form of Christianity many of the kind of grand narrative changes that you're talking about go on beyond the end of the book and it's not a sort of a complete process yeah um you know so for instance you know, you know, the, the kind of li the, the fact that by the end of the period of your your book which kind of goes up into the 1590s More is less, that right yeah. um yeah. that uh you know catholics and, and protestants are sort of ineradicable um, you know, it's, it's clear that neither side are, are going to, as it were, win and, and, and kind of get rid of the others. Yeah. That that, that um, ends up having, ends up leading to kind of forms of toleration and, and to this idea that um, religion comes out of the public sphere um, and that, um, but th th that's a very reluctant toleration and, and, and that's maybe something we need to, need to remember. That, that's absolutely right and, and, and very well put. And, uh, you know, toleration is another of those kind of, you know, grand narratives, mm. how we go from an, an, an intolerant, oppressive, um, inverted commas, medieval past to a more enlightened modernity. Um, and it's true that uh, the toleration does have its roots in the, the early modern period, but mm. the thing we tend to lose sight of with that word um, uh, and that concept of toleration is that absolutely everybody thought this was a really bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. um, you know, tolerating something meant putting up with something which is undesirable um, until such time as it was possible to get rid of it uh, mm. again. So, um, yes, absolutely here again, the law of unintended consequences that mm. <clears throat> in the Reformation period, I mean, all sides um, had a, an absolutely unitary notion of truth. Um, they believed absolutely in, uh, in conformity and uniformity. Um, but in England, and indeed actually across much of Europe, in the end it proves impossible to, to impose that. Mm. And, um, you know, so the alternative is, is perpetual civil unrest or even civil war yeah. um, versus actually finding ways to live alongside people uh, whose ideas you disapprove of and mm. who you think are probably going to hell, mm. but for the moment <laughs> at least, yeah. um, you know, we have to find ways of... Um, uh, of tolerating each other in, in civil society. And, mm. you know, over the longer term, and it does go significantly past the end point of that book, I think, uh, yes, you're right, that um, it involves a, a, a slow but um, uh, progressive removal of religion from the sort of organizing principle of the state and civil society mm. uh, in, into privatized spheres. I'd hesitate to call that secularization because, um, you know, probably people remain 
individually pious and interested in religion actually until relatively recent and modern times. But um, it is a kind of privatization of faith, mm. which is not really happening in my period, but I think the roots of it have been, um, or, or the seeds of it have been sown in my period. Does the otherness of the past um, make, it, make it harder to write a kind of popular book about it? You know, particularly when you're dealing with um, people who are arguing about sort of to a modern, mostly secular audience, yeah. very abstruse theological questions and are, you know, murdering each other. I think, it, I think it probably does. The people that don't um, have that sort of familiarity with yes, the concept that they might otherwise um, have. Uh, so of course, um, uh, actually modern Christians in some ways um, have a sort of false familiarity yeah. with their ancestors of, of, of the past. You, you, you can think um, that things have remained <laughs> the, the same when they've changed very, very dramatically as, as, uh, um, uh, in, in those ways too. Um, Yes, I mean, there's, there's obviously a kind of um, a, a difficulty of imaginative engagement with a world where people think that for having the wrong metaphysical beliefs about the nature of the, the Eucharist, mm. uh, you, you know, you deserve to be killed. Um, and um, yes, uh, or indeed that um, we can't really find people who are like us mm. in this period. I mean, this is w one of the things that I think... Um, it probably confronts all historians, but becomes more of an issue the further back you, you go. If you're just looking for heroes and villains, you're deluding yourself. Mm. So, so there's you know, almost literally nobody in my book um, who did not think that in some circumstances the death penalty was the appropriate punishment for heresy. Of course, mm. they had different definitions of what actually heresy was. Um, and I suppose there are two ways we can approach that. One is just to say, you know, the past was irredeemably awful. All these people were, you know, absolutely terrible. Thank goodness we're not like them. <laughs> we can sort of, you know, gawp at them. Um, or what I think is more difficult, but what I would um, like to try to do, I think, is that, you know, we have to sort of, <laughs> we, have to make that, we have to make that leap. We have to find, you know, those points of connection that we do have with these people. We have to... Um, ex, you know, accept and be prepared to live with their unlikeness to us. Mm. Uh, we have to some extent to be prepared to judge them by the standards that their contemporaries would have, would have judged them, you know, who seemed like good people and who seemed like terrible people in the lights of their, their, their neighbours and fellow citizens at, at the time. Mm. Um, and, um, I mean, of course, in some ways, if I... It, it, if I was being um, sort of pragmatic about this, I would say that that kind of empathetic engagement with otherness is actually not an obscure historical skill. This is, you know, one of the most pressing needs mm. of modern society as we deal with, mm. um, you know, an ever more divisive politics and we deal with mass movements of, of people and migration across borders. So, you know, how we, how we live with difference mm. and how we find points of connection with the other you know, this is, this is very topical, very contemporary. Well, that sort of leads me nicely on to asking you about whether uh, contemporary issues were sort of in your mind at all when you were, when you were writing this book. Or, you know, because I suppose it's possible that they were in there somewhere, but, you know, you weren't consciously thinking about them. But, um, you know, one thinks of um, sort of religious intolerance uh, that is in many parts of the world today. Uh, yeah. You know, you think of Brexit, of course, which you've already mm -hmm. uh, brought up, but which uh, we probably shouldn't touch with a barge pole. Um, <laughs> um, do, you th <coughs> do, do you think that those kind of issues uh, affect the kind of questions that you ask or your, your sort of approach to the period at all, and consciously or otherwise? Yeah, well, I think they, um, they must do. Mm. And, and, and of course, it's, you know, it's, it's true of all historical writing that it's you know it's not about the past it's about the present you know mm. uh, or, or at least ways in which we in the present can um, try and conjure up a version of the past which interests us and makes sense to us so you know in that in that sense um, yes the history we all write must be um, concerned with I mean not not consciously in that I thought you know this is going to be a sort of historical commentary on these on these um, on these issues um, but I mean it has struck me since. The book was effectively being written um, through two great British national conversations, mm. um, which were the, the 2014 independence referendum in Scotland and the 2016 Brexit referendum in the UK as, as a whole. Um, and um, 
Now, perhaps not consciously or not entirely consciously, I think that did influence you know, how I was interested in, in, in the book. I mean, really important issues um, which uh, those societies deeply divided over, mm. which families divided over, um, which did involve mass campaigns of persuasion, which created new forms of identity and identity politics. I mean, it's, a, it's an idea I, I, I play a bit more lightly in the, in the book, but in, in talking about it since, you know, I have <laughs> drawn a possibly um, slightly overplayed comparison between the ways that um, the fallout from the Brexit um, uh, referendum has actually created a new kind of sort of ideologically pro-European British person, mm. um, uh, among whom I would probably, you know, full disclosure, now include myself. Mm. Um, uh, whereas, you know, in, in, in the past, um, I wasn't didn't really think about it. I didn't very really much. think about yeah. it very much. I was kind of in favour of the European Union, but I couldn't have told you much a, a, about it. And mm. you know, in some ways, I think I, um, you know, you can paradoxically argue that the Reformation actually creates modern Catholicism mm. in the British Isles. It creates Roman Catholicism. Um, and that in some ways that is as much a new creation, a new form of identity as Protestantism is, as people have to decide where they, they stand, you know, <laughs> where they stand on Rome, whether that's the Treaty of Rome or the yeah. Bishop of Rome. This is a really broad question, but um, yeah. what, what do you... What do you <laughs> this is a very broad question. What do you think is the purpose of history? What's the purpose of yeah, history? Yeah, should um, it have um, a sort of practical um, use in any kind? Goodness. Um, well... Um, Gosh, I mean, I've always been a bit more of a proponent of the, uh, the sort of Mount Everest school of thought on this. You know, why do you climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think a sort of a kind of instrumentalist defense of history. We must study the past to avoid making the mistakes of the past. Um, and so that we can compete for government funding mm -hmm. with, you know, the STEM subjects, which are obvious more practical. It seems to me a bit of a, a, of a dead end. And mm -hmm. I think trying to find lessons in the past which can be applied absolutely to, mm. to the present, you know, can actually be rather, rather dangerous. I, think it's I, mean, sort of I don't know, you know, Anthony yeah. Eden in 1956 was convinced that NASA was Hitler and that, you know, appeasing the Egyptians um, would be repeating the mistake of the 1930s and as a result we ended up with the sort of catastrophe of, of Suez. So I think... Yeah, you so know, you that, can just draw the wrong you messages. Draw, you're yeah. very likely to draw the wrong messages. Mm. Um, on, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, I, I do think that a sense of history uh, is really important. Um, or to put it in a, another way, a good sense of history, a sense of a complicated history, mm -hmm. of, a, of a rounded history, uh, is, uh, is very important because, you know, bad history <laughs> leads to very bad results, leads to very narrow forms of, of identity politics. So um, I suppose if you're putting me up against the wall, I think... Um, Yes, studying history, thinking seriously about history, trying to make those imaginative connections with you know, these very other people who didn't think like us, um, I think that has the capacity to make us more fully rounded and more tolerant people. Mm. You know, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll raise your question, what's the purpose of history? You know, what's, what's the purpose of life? What's it mm. all for? Why, why are we here? And, you know, I think part of that must be recognizing a sense of common humanity, mm. you know, both with those who are our contemporaries, but also with those who've gone before us as, as well. So, mm. I mean, I think, you know, history is, is a kind of duty to, to the dead to mm. tell their stories, mm. you know, in, a, in an honest and respectful way. If you could go back in time to this period... Um, to the, the 16th century. Um, is there any conversation you would like to listen in on? You know, would you like to be a kind of fly in the wall um, at court? Or, you know, are, are there any sort of mysteries like that that you, you wish we could know more about? What would you do if you, you kind of had a time machine? Oh, goodness. Um, gosh, and that's really, that's really put me on the spot. It's a very, very good and very interesting question. And I'm sort of you know, struggling to have an, an, an answer on it. Um, uh, I mean, okay, I, I, I suppose I would say um, um, that, you know, I wouldn't want necessarily, you know, to be in one of the galleries at, at, at Whitehall and sort of, you know, eavesdrop on some crucial conversation um, between Henry and Thomas Cromwell or between Elizabeth and, 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 and William Cecil. I'd just like to go to the pub and <laughs> right. sit in the corner mm. and, you know, watch what people did when they came in and how they spoke to each other and, you know, what topics came up in their in their conversation you yeah. know how long it took them to get from the price of wheat to you know 
what the Spanish were up to or what was going on at, at, at court. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose, and I mean, maybe one of the answers is uh, that you wouldn't really want to go back <laughs> to, to the 16th century, or well, you would presumably you'd like to visit, but well, not, not, yeah, no, ex not to exactly. Live there. And yeah. uh, you know, the sort of the historian's joke, which you've probably heard, is you know, when people say, "What period of history would you like to, to live in?" You know, the answer is, "How close to the present am I allowed to have?" Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the second part of that answer is why the, you, you say, "Well, dentistry." Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. Uh, vaccines, uh, well, th indeed. things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did yeah. ask, I, I asked an American uh, professor this because she was sort of bewailing the terrible um, uh, kind of modern condition of the world. Uh, and I said, well, hang on, which period of history would you like to, to go back to? Uh, and she just said, the Obama presidency. So, oh. you know, not very far back. Right. Um, <laughs> um, you make some really interesting points. Um, uh, in the book about the sort of what looks retrospectively like the naivety of religious and political leaders. So, for instance, that Luther seemed to have this idea that if you um, translated the Bible into vernacular uh, languages and gave it to people, they would read it and they would just um, they would just all have the one true understanding mm. um, and that they wouldn't kind of go mm -hmm. off in their own different directions yeah. and, the, and, and have different interpretations. Yeah. Um, and sort of similarly with, with Henry, uh, there's a sense here and there that he just thought, you know, if, if I just tell people to be uniform in their religious yeah. beliefs and not to tend to one side or the other, if I just issue a proclamation, they'll do it. Yeah. Um, do you think, I mean, were those beliefs naive or is that just our <laughs> benefit um, of hindsight coming in there? Uh, yes. Um, well, you, you asked me a little while ago about misconceptions that mm. people have about the, the, the Reformation period or the 16th century and actually one that uh, I do come across quite a lot um, is that uh, the, the Protestant reformers wanted people to read the Bible for themselves and to make up their own minds. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. That was absolutely the last thing they, they wanted. They, mm. you know, they thought that um, you know, if, if people had access to um, scripture in the vernacular and, you know, were able to get past the lies they were being told by, by the priests, um, then the true meaning of scripture uh, would be absolutely evident to them. I mean, you know, one could call that a naive belief. One could just call that a genuinely sincere mm -hmm. belief in, you know, the, the ability of the word of God to make itself plain mm -hmm. uh, to um, a right-minded believer. But of course, you say it, they're disabused pretty they're dis quickly. They're disabused yeah. of that pretty quickly. And um, yes, in fact, people do read scripture and do start making up their own minds and, you know, noticing that, you know, things like infant baptism or the doctrine of the Trinity don't seem to be particularly present in, 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 in scripture. Um, uh, yes, so um, there is part of me, I have to say, that rather sort of in, in, enjoys the, <laughs> the anarchic aspects of the Reformation and those who thought um, whether um, ideologically like these reformers, Catholic and Protestant, or politically like Henry VIII, that mm -hmm. they could simply tell people what to do, what to think, um, are disabused of, of, of that. And um, even this you know, um, monstrously tyrannical figure, Henry VIII, you know, with a lot of blood on, on his hands. And you know, actually, back to misconceptions, but the idea that Henry VIII is this sort of lovely, cuddly English folk hero mm. is one that I'd quite like more yeah. people to be disabused of. Um, but the fact do, that do even, people, even- Do you come across people that, that think well, can like you, that. yeah, kind of, well, I mean, people know he's a sort of monster, but they kind of quite like him But anyway. he was strong. He yeah. was, he, he <laughs> was, he was a, indeed strong, yeah. yes. Um, um, yes, that's, yes, the sort of cult of strong leaders is probably somewhere we don't want yes. to, to, to go with this, <laughs> with, with this either. But uh, um, yes, Henry issuing these proclamations, just telling people mm. to stop arguing, you mm. know, um, uh, is of course pretty ineffective. I suppose Henry was probably physically quite cuddly, uh, you know, <laughs> substantial uh, anyway. Well, indeed, <laughs> yeah. Um, would there have been uh, an English Reformation, do you think, if it weren't for Henry VIII's need for, for a divorce? Mm. It um, sort of comes back to what you were saying about yes. you know, the importance of contingency and, yeah. and, and so on. Yeah. Um, are there just too many variables? Well, you know, too many uh, different I mean, things I think happens. those kind of counterfactual questions um, are, uh, are really Im important. And I should have an answer to this because um, actually going back um, a significant number of years now, but I was um, involved in presenting a um, documentary on BBC Four, um, a, a series called What If? Mm. 
um, uh, and um, the, the conceit of the program was that there were turning points in history where things had dramatically changed. Mm -hmm. um, and they were fairly dramatic ones, like mm -hmm. th they had a program on the Saxon victory at Hastings mm -hmm. and the German victory in the Battle of Britain and the Jacobites pressing on you know, south um, uh, from, um, from Preston uh, in 1745. That's a fantastic idea. I've never come um, across that before. No, well, it yeah. sort of um, d disappeared probably into well-deserved obscurity. But yeah. um, uh, my particular um, episode, uh, the, the what if, uh, really was that the Pope says, oh, all right then. And um, in 1529, grants Henry um, his annulment from the, the, the arrogant marriage so that he can marry Anne Boleyn. And would we then have had a reformation? Um, and, of course... Um, uh, it makes for a pretty boring show if you say no, things would have been much the same. So we, we, we ran this fantasy about uh, how England, of course, remains Catholic mm. um, and the whole kind of you know, culture of, of the country is, is very different. Great Britain, of course, is never created. Mm. Um, uh, the world language uh, is, is Spanish and you know, English is a sort of offshore version of Swedish, which no one really sort of speaks. That's such um, a wonderful um, <laughs> format for a sort of TV programme, because it's, yeah. it's very often the case that TV programmes, um, you know, they end up one way or the other kind of encouraging people to view history as about mm. someone, an authority figure telling you facts yeah. and, and telling you how it really was and so on. And, and the sense that history is kind of about debate or it's about mm -hmm. contingency or all that, that kind of yeah. thing is sort of sadly Well, you, I mean, the, there are so many of these what ifs, aren't there? And I mean, yeah. I suppose, you know, um, uh, you know, the, uh, there's, there's, there's those virtual history books. Yes, and, um, and, and, and the word that we historians use is contingency. Mm. Um, but, you know, we're, we're really talking about chance. Mm. Um, uh, aren't we? And I suppose you find those in every century. But um, you know, um, what if Henry had never been king? Mm. What if you know um, Arthur had had lived, and you know he and Catherine had um, carried on further in the dynasty in the way where they were supposed to? Um, would things have been different? Almost certainly, they, they they would have been just as they'd have been different in the 17th century if Charles the mm. elder brother, Prince Henry, had had, had survived. Um, I don't think we can categorically say that there would have been no reformation in England. I think there certainly would have been a powerful reform movement. Mm. Um, and who's to say how much traction that would have, have gathered. Um, but I do think asking those kind of factual questions is interesting and important because back to the myths, the idea that there was something sort of inevitable about the reformation, mm. that, um, uh, um, the, 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 the British were just kind of, you know, destined to be Protestants in the way that the, the Spanish or the Italians were destined to be, to be Catholics. Mm -hmm. You know, those, uh, I think, are worth questioning. And, um, and it's part of uh, this, you know, the grand story of our rise to global greatness yeah. and, and all that kind of thing. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, are there any sort of popular TV programmes or things like that that you watch about the 16th century? Are you a fan of kind of uh, Hilary Mantel, for instance, or... People keep on recommending to me the, I'm going to mangle this, but it's the Shard... Shard, Shard Lake, C.J. Sansom, uh, de detective novels. Are you a um, fan of, of either of those or the, or the uh, TV programmes? <laughs> I have to say, um, I tend to avoid uh, TV shows about the, the 16th century. Um, Would you just feels, be shouting at the screen? It's a little bit too much like work, and my wife's never quite forgiven me for the time we went to see... Uh, the Kate Blanchett Elizabeth movie, uh, <laughs> and I was almost sort of shouting yeah. at, the, at the screen. And of course, you know, it's ridiculous to yeah. to expect these programs. They um, get the embroidery to, right. That's well, the sort they, of they, <laughs> they, they, they do. Um, and I, I mean, I haven't read any of those um, Tudor detective novels, the, mm. the Samson ones. They've been well received, I, I think, and I read a lot of detective stories. But yeah. that just felt a little bit close to home. Hilary Mantel, of course, is in a very different category mm. because these are these are, these are very important literary novels mm. um, and um, I, I have read those and I'm looking forward to the, the, the third one and I'd, I'd watched the TV series uh, too and while I think you know my, <laughs> my, my reading of particular figures of both Cromwell and Thomas More would be very different mm. from, from hers I think just the sort of seriousness of that act of historical imagination mm. um, is, uh, uh, Taking, is I think you know, the way that it, they sort of take us into the mental worlds of uh, of people and show that they're sort of interestingly different. Yes, so it's, it's, I think that's, yeah. that, that's absolutely that's absolutely right. And um, you know, I do think that um, imagination as um, a quality that historians should try and exercise mm. is you know sometimes rather un underrated. And um, so our you know natural assumption is that you know the the, the scriptwriters, the the, um, 
that the film directors and the novelists have stuff to learn from us. I think we have things to learn from Absolutely. them as well. Yeah. Um, it's a yeah. question that sometimes comes up with, with some of my students. Um, it's a sort of a who would want to be Henry's counsellor sort of question. Because, um, you know, although there are some of them who managed to go through the rain, uh, you know, very, very successfully and very kind of adroitly, yeah. um, it's quite tough at the top uh, under yeah. Henry. And you could say the same, mm. um, you know, for Edward as, uh, as well. So, um, yeah. Or why would somebody want to be Prime Minister or, or well, President quite, of the United States? Well, at least they know? don't get their heads chopped <laughs> well, off. Well, yeah, <laughs> yes, not yet. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but no, that does yeah. come up, I suppose, with, with kind of Theresa May right now. You know, why mm. would you want that job? Yeah. But, um, but do you, I mean, because do you, do you, some of them must be, they, they're, they're obviously aware that previous kind of favourites and counsellors have fallen from power quite often quite dramatically yeah. or have come to a, a, mm -hmm. a sticky end. Um, no. I don't know. What, what I'm do trying think? to think of, yes, the, the only cases I can think of, of course, um, w was it the, um, goodness, uh, uh, was it the Duchess of Milan who politely turned down a, a marriage um, approach from Henry VIII, mm -hmm. <laughs> saying that you know, she was quite attached to her head and, yeah. and she, wanted to, she wanted to keep it. Um, but, um, uh, of course, for subjects within England, you know, um, saying no to the king is something you don't mm -hmm. you don't really want to uh, to, to do. So yeah. you know, if you're invited to be Lord Chancellor or whatever it it, it might be, you, you step up and uh, and, and do it. Um, you uh, don't pretend to be ill. You not, <laughs> well, n no. Um, so I mean, one of the incidents in, in the book actually is Elizabeth the first pretending to be ill mm. as a means um, to try and get out of going to mass mm. in her sister uh, Mary's reign. Yeah, um, I suppose, and there are some who are obviously you know incredibly successful. You know. The Cecils and, and, and so on. Yeah. Um, if you didn't study the, the Reformation, is there another kind of period of history that you'd, you'd really like to do? Because, um, you know, mm. uh, we all do know more and more about less and less. And that's yes. certainly not the case with, with a book like this, which is wonderfully sort of broad. But a lot of academic historians kind of, uh, you know, they cultivate a 10 year period or, yes. or sort of a, a micro period. And, and that, yeah. you know, that can be quite. Um, Quite sort of damaging, maybe for, for, for the discipline. I think, but it's quite rare to switch. I think that's that, that's right. Periods yes, or um, switch uh, countries. I mean, the, the, the one can think of a few examples of people who've sort of dramatically switched periods. I mean, uh, Ian, Ian Kershaw, Ian Kershaw mm. comes to mind. His first book, as people may or may not know, is on um, Bolton Priory in the 13th century, I think. Um, but but generally, we sort of stick in our stick in our furrow, and I do think that's 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 a shame. I mean, it's part of the. The demise of those grand narratives that mm. uh, you know, even a couple of generations ago, um, you know, people um, you know, um, like Hugh Trevor Roper felt you know, <laughs> equally at home in the 17th century yes. as in the 20th, and yeah. it would be rare for that to um, to, to, to happen now. Um, uh, I'd like to think I could write about other periods if mm. I really wanted to put my mind to it. And uh, you wouldn't I mean, be worried about sort of stepping on anyone else's toes. Well, I mean, it's, it, it probably doesn't sound very sort of dramatic, but you know, one of my books does kind of you know go through the 17th century and on into the 18th century mm. a, a, a bit. Yeah. Um, um, I suppose I it's, always it's yeah, a little bit frightening, isn't it? Because the, you know, the further you get from your sort of little specialist area, and uh, again, yours is not a little specialist area. Mine probably is much more. Um, you know, the more you think, well, there's someone who's an absolute obsessive with this person or whatever, who will yeah. point out that I've made some embarrassing mistake. Yeah. Uh, yes, the, the, there is that, and I think it is. Um, it, it, it's one of the liberating things. You know, once you commit to writing more sort of um, populist uh, or, or at least you know history for a general readership, mm. you know, I think the step you have to make, which is actually really hard for us to make, is you know to not worry about what half a dozen people whom you know really well and whose work you know really well will, mm. will think about the book because you're not, you're not writing for them. So I think mm. you, know, you do have to be prepared um, for specialists thinking that it's oversimplified or that it's wrong on, on particular points. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, most of the time I think you're, you're right, that would be the thing that would head us off um, from starting again in a new period. But it would, yeah. I, I mean, it would be impossible to write a book like this that would satisfy everyone. You know, or absolutely satisfy yeah. every single sort of specialist in there. Oh, every, no, yeah. Ab yeah. absolutely. No, I think that's right. And you almost wouldn't, wouldn't want it to. Yeah. You, know? And, yeah. you know, people want to get good reviews. But, yes. you know, you want 
You want 90% good reviews and 10% bad reviews, I yeah. think, you know, just to show. <laughs> right, <okay. laughs> that would be my ideal, I think. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Why, why is that? Why, why would you like the sort of 10% bad reviews? Well, um, you, you, to show that, you know, the book is capable of upsetting people. Yeah. And that, you know, it's it probably can, not saying anything yeah. interesting enough if, it's, if yeah. some people aren't upset. I think that would yeah. be my, my instinctive sense okay. about that. Um, and so, well, I think we've covered everything that I wanted to ask, but... Um, Really, just a, a final question, which is, um, what's what's next? Um, you know, what are you kind of researching now, or what kind of things do you want to do? Gosh, in the well, that's uh, that's that's a good question, um, and I'm still sort of recovering from from 2017 and the big Reformation year when you know I also um, wrote a book on Luther and the commemoration of um, uh, of the Reformation in addition to to, to this one. Um, uh, so I don't have a sort of big project in hand. Um, uh, I'm actually working on um, uh, sort of social and religious cultural history of the Orkney Islands in the north of Scotland. Um, which is where you're from. Which is, right? is where I'm from, so this is very sort of self-indulgent. Um, and it's a change of scale and a change of pace. And um, uh, Scotland is, of course, literally a foreign country mm -hmm. in the, the early modern period. Um, and uh, it has all those anxieties that you were saying about... Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the specialists who've worked on the history of Scotland for, for decades, you know, are um, some way ahead of me in, in the game on this. But yeah. um, it's, uh, it, it, it's fun. I'm enjoying it. Mm. Wonderful. Okay. Right. Well, uh, Peter Marshall, thank you very, very much for coming in and talking it's to me. It's been a great pleasure. Thank okay. you, David. Great.